Morning, friends. Angie here, carrying on with the book of Galatians. Um, and I think we'll just go straight into it. I'm going to play an old fashioned hymn again to start with. We'll just see what, what the book of Galatians has to say. <clears throat> Here we go. I will make the dark. Oh, sorry, I didn't start at the beginning. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin. see why I get copyright claims when I just play a part of it and talk around it but we'll plow on. So Galatians 3, trust in Christ not the law. You crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? I think the King James says who has bewitched you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Christ, Jesus, in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete 
by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It's not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. Answer this question. Does the God who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, working things in your lives you could never do for yourselves, does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving or because you trust him to do them in you? Don't these things happen among you just as they happened with Abraham? He believed God and that act of belief was turned into a life that was right with God. Is it not obvious to you that perhaps, or persons who put their trust in Christ, not persons who put their trust in the law, are like Abraham, children of faith? It was all laid out beforehand in scripture that God would set things right with non-Jews by faith. Scripture anticipated this in the promise to Abraham, all nations will be blessed in you. So those now who live by faith are blessed along with Abraham who lived by faith. This is no new doctrine. And that means that anyone who tries to live by his own effort, independent of God, is doomed to failure. Scripture backs this up. Quote, utterly cursed is every person who fails to carry out every detail written in the book of the law. So for people that think that by being good, quote unquote, that gets them to heaven, um, there isn't a human being alive that hasn't broken one law. You know, whether it's to covet your neighbor's goods or disrespect your parents or whatever it might be, there's nobody alive that has never even just broken one of the Ten Commandments, you know. Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not steal, you know. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, you know. Obviously, most people haven't murdered or raped or, or robbed a bank, but we've all sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The obvious impossibility of carrying out such a moral program should make it plain that no one can sustain a relationship with God that way. The person who lives in right relationship with God does it by embracing what God arranges for him. Oh, that's such a relief. Doing things for God is the opposite of entering into what God does for you. That's deep. Habakkuk had it right. Quote, the person who believes God is set right by God, and that's the real life. Rule keeping does not naturally evolve into living by faith but only perpetuates itself in more and more rule keeping, a fact observed in scripture. Quote, the one who does these things, rule keeping, continues to live by them. Christ redeemed us from that self-defeating cursed life by absorbing it completely into himself. Do you remember the scripture that says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree? That is what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he became a curse and at the same time dissolved the curse. And now because of that, the air is cleared and we can see that Abraham's blessing is present and available for non-Jews too. We are all able to receive God's life, his spirit in and with us by believing just the way Abraham received it. Friends, let me give you an example from everyday affairs of the free life I'm talking about. Once a person's will has been ratified, no one else can annul it or add to it. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his descendant. You will observe that scripture in the careful language of a legal document does not say to descendants, referring to everybody in general, but to your descendant, the noun note is singular, referring to Christ. 
Wow. This is the way I interpret this. A will earlier ratified by God is not annulled by an addendum attached 430 years later, thereby negating the promise of the will. No, this addendum with its instructions and regulations has nothing to do with the promised inheritance in the will. What is the point then of the law, the attached addendum? It was a thoughtful addition to the original covenant promises made to Abraham. The purpose of the law was to keep a sinful people in the way of salvation until Christ, the descendant, came, inheriting the promises and distributing them to us. Obviously, this law was not a first-hand encounter with God. It was arranged by angelic messengers through a middleman, Moses. But if there is a middleman, as there was at Sinai, then the people are not dealing directly with God, are they? But the original promise is the direct blessing of God received by faith. If such is the case, is the law then an anti-promise, a negation of God's will for us? Yeah, if such is the case, is the law then an anti-promise, a negation of God's will for us? That's a bit clumsy of a sentence, but anyway, not, not at all. Its purpose was to make obvious to everyone that we are in ourselves out of right relationship with God, and therefore to show us the futility of devising some religious system for getting by our own efforts, what we can only get by waiting in faith for God to complete his promise. For if any kind of rule keeping had power to create life in us, we would certainly have gotten it by this time. Until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic law. The law was like those Greek tutors with which you are familiar, who escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, making sure the children will really get to the place they set out for. But now you have arrived at your destination. By faith in Christ, you are in direct relationship with God. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start, it also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe, Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise in Christ's family. In Christ's family, there can be no division into law, into Jew and non-Jew, slave or free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. I would compare this with the King James if I were you, because this is quite a heavy, heavy teaching and, and it's certainly not uh, what Luciferians do, some satanic cults do is uh, say that oh well um, if we're not bound by the law then let's just do all the evil we can and then that will hasten Jesus coming or, or that will hasten you know the antichrist is what it actually will hasten um, so it's certainly not licensed to sin but it's just saying if you're a goody two-shoes who think you're saved by uh, obeying most laws, then you're deluded and Christ died in vain, you know. Let me show you the implications of this. As long as the heir is a minor, he has no advantage over the slave. Though legally he owns the, the entire inheritance, he is subject to tutors and administrators until whatever date the father has set for emancipation. That is the way it is with us. When we were minors, we were just like slaves, ordered around by simple instructions. The tutors and administrators of this world 
with no say in the conduct of our own lives. But when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent his son, born among us out of a woman, born under the conditions of the law, so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives, crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you're not a slave, but a child? And if you are a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. Earlier, before you knew God personally, you were enslaved to so-called gods that had nothing of the divine about them. But now that you know the real God, or rather, since God knows you, how can you possibly subject yourself again to, these, to those paper tigers? For that is exactly what you do when you are intimidated into scrupulously observing all the traditions, taboos and superstitions associated with special days and seasons and years. I'm afraid that all my hard work among you has gone up in a puff of smoke. Just gonna read that again slowly, this is really deep. How can you possibly subject yourselves again to those paper tigers? But that's exactly what you do when you're intimidated into scrupulously observing all the traditions, taboos and superstitions associated with special days and seasons and years. Wow. Wow. My dear friends, what, what I would really like you to do is to try to put yourselves in my shoes to the same extent that I, when I was with you, put myself in yours. You were very sensitive and kind then. You did not come down on me personally. You were well aware that the reason I ended up preaching to you was that I was physically broken and so prevented from continuing my journey. I was forced to stop with you. That is how I came to preach to you. And don't you remember that even though taking in a sick guest was most troublesome for you, you chose to treat me as well as you would have treated an angel of God, as well as you would have treated Jesus himself if he had visited you. What has happened to the satisfaction you felt at that time? There were some of you then who, if possible, would have given your very eyes to me. That's how deeply you cared. And now have I suddenly become your enemy simply by telling you the truth? I can't believe it. Those heretical teachers go to great lengths to flatter you, but their motives are rotten. They want to shut you out of the free world of God's grace so that you will always depend on them for approval and direction, making them feel important. It's a good thing to be ardent in doing good, but not just when I'm in your presence. Can't you continue the same concern for both my person and my message when I'm away from you that you had when I was with you? Do you know how I feel right now and will feel until Christ's life becomes visible in your lives? Like a mother in the pain of childbirth. Oh, I keep wishing that I was with you. Then I wouldn't be reduced to this blunt letter writing language out of sheer frustration. Tell me now, you who have become so enamoured with the law, have you paid close attention to that law? Abraham, remember, had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. The son of the slave woman was born by human connivance. The son of the free woman was born by God's promise. This illustrates the very thing we are dealing with now. The two births represent two ways of being in relationship with God. One is from Mount Sinai in Arabia. Arabia. It corresponds with what is now going on in Jerusalem, a slave life producing slaves as offspring. This is the way of Hagar. 
In contrast to that, there's an invisible Jerusalem, a free Jerusalem, and she's our mother. This is the way of Sarah. Remember what Isaiah wrote. Rejoice, barren woman who bears no children. Shout and cry out, woman who has no birth pangs, because the children of the barren woman now surpass the children of the chosen woman. Isn't it clear, friends, that you, like Isaac, are children of promise? In the days of Hagar and Sarah, the child who came from faithless connivance, Ishmael, harassed the child who came empowered by the spirit from the faithful promise, Isaac. Isn't it clear that the harassment you're now experiencing from the Jerusalem heretics follows that old pattern? There is a scripture that tells us what to do. Expel the slave mother with her son, for the slave son will not inherit with the free son. Isn't that conclusive? We are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And that's interesting, and that's why I say to people, you can't read the Bible and be dogmatic with it. You need to read it with the Spirit to highlight the truths that the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to you from the heart of God. Because in another scripture in the Old Testament, when Abraham expels the, the concubine and the illegitimate son that he'd had, Ishmael, he cries to God and says, this hurts my heart. I'm doing it because you've told me to and Sarah's told me to, but really hurts my heart, Lord. Just promise me one thing that, that this son that I'm expelling will inherit in the end. And God promised that to him. So that's contrary what, to what the Apostle Paul is writing here, but they're probably different contexts. So we'll leave it for now there and we'll finish with this. And let's have a blessed week. We're still in Sukkot. I did two nights in the cabin and then I bailed last night, but actually I didn't have a very good night's sleep last night. There's been all sorts kicking off. No, I don't like that version. I love the version um, simple version like I like I, I don't I like simple versions I wonder if there's um this is children that can work Luther Nordic choir let's try that <laughs> Prayers 
and um, try not to feel overwhelmed. Have a good week, everybody. And um, I just pray that we do the next right thing in Jesus' name. Uh, lots of links underneath. Please share and subscribe if you haven't already. God bless.